Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I shall try and be as quick fire as has been wished. I speak as a programme director for the Northeastern uh, Deanery, the Northern Deanery, and uh, incoming uh, STC chair, outgoing TPD eventually. So I, I have a very, very, very big training hat on. Um, this is our, our present situation where we are uh, doing vatslobectomy in Newcastle. We are training uh, people who have interest and competences uh, to do vatslobectomy. We've trained five registrars so far in the last two years. The near future, we've just bought ourselves a toy. Um, maybe this is the future. I, I, I wait and see, but I'm certainly going to have a, a play with it. Um, and really, from a training program director point of view, there, I have to accept that there are challenges to training. There's limited hours, and that's been felt across, uh, across the world. Uh, Bob McKenna was talking to us in November last year. The American hours of work are also being reduced. There's therefore considerably less hours operating. There's a need to maximise training opportunities. And um, the GMC uh, is now looking specifically at areas of our practice. And simulation has been there for uh, a few of the surveys. And simulation is something that, that we need to get to grips with as thoracic surgeons. Consultant jobs are all specified as high tech. There hasn't been a thoracic surgery job that's been advertised that hasn't had. Uh, uh, a request to be um, at least that's lobectomy uh, thinking, if not that's lobectomy doing. Um, the Newcastle Surgical Training Centre allows for an awful lot of training to take place. You'll see that it's entirely high tech. It's, it's, it's like six operating theatres back to back um, with absolutely every modcon, plasma televisions, full theatre work. Uh, all the stapling and uh, diathermy and other uh, radiation um, uh, media are there for use for simulation. We have uh, a regular source of cadavers um, and therefore cadaveric dissection classes are run on a regular basis. We're going to be running a cadaveric transplant course later on this year. Um, we've already run uh, a, a cadaveric trauma course early this year um, we are running wet labs into cardiac revascularization at the moment and, and hopefully in the near future we'll be running a cadaveric bats as well. Most people have access to this, a lap trainer, which um, gives you a little bit of a feel of what it's like to operate within a closed box. Now there are three other areas in, that I've looked at to see what comparable training is like. If you look at the commercial airline pilot um, for uh, a, a budget airline that we have in the UK, they themselves have got nine simulators uh, in, in regional distributions in the UK. They've got identical flight decks to those that they would be using on a plane. They have information that they can put into the software to assimilate weather, temperature, wind speed, etc. And in fact, all eventualities are possible to simulate. The pilot training pathway allows for 40 hours of uh, simulation tr computer-based training uh, and then non-passenger flying, followed by 20 to 100 cadet supervised flights and a co-pilot will take at least eight years to get to uh, pilot status with an annual line check, which means that someone will get on the plane and potentially turf you out of your seat in the driving seat if you don't comply. There are two full days of simulation a year for the rest of a pilot's career lifetime. If you look at a fireman, a retained fireman um, will have to do uh, two weeks of simulation training, full-time uh, uh, fireman, 16 weeks of repetitive training. And every shift, they will have some form of training. There's computer-based training question and answer on every shift. There's virtual reality investment in different scenarios are played out. You will fail if you can't manage your breathing apparatus and you'll have time out from your, from your uh, training. And it takes about eight to ten years to become captain of a station. This is an apprenticeship model, fully supervised all the way. If you look at an oil rig situation, there's a safety training school, which is a preparatory school to allow you before you go on to an oil rig. You have to understand your specific environment, safe working practices, 
hazard identification, and there's a whole bunch of emergency procedures that you have to accomplish before you're allowed on to an oil rig. There's a refresher safety course every two to three years. There are safety certification papers in order. There's a mentor on the oil rig, and there is a drill every Sunday, a man overboard drill from an oil rig in whatever water conditions. There's also spill, blowout, and terrorist response drills. So you can see they're covering absolutely every eventuality. So what do we do in surgery? We have a lap trainer. And pretty much across the board, that's what we do. Uh, some um, uh, companies have invested in a simulation. Africon have given us a task kit that's about £1,000. There's a Cemento kit, which I'll show you shortly, which is about £9,000. And our core trainees manage uh, to play on that two times a year for a week. This is something that you can plug into your laptop, take home with you, and it does analyse to a certain extent what your movements are. There are three tasks that you're expected to do. As you can see on the screen, this is clip a vessel, this is put a suture through a ring, and this is tying a suture into corporeally. There is no tactile feedback, and there's no real analysis of movements. It is definitely task orientated, and you can achieve certification before progressing. What we really want is this sort of uh, Luke Skywalker Walker looking at um, um, uh, a, a, a model version, a simulation of, of what's happening elsewhere. What, what we've got probably is virtual reality. Um, and we've certainly got virtual reality. We can all stand in front of our plasma screens at home and, and work our way through uh, different game consoles. We've tried virtual reality in a, in a, in a theatre setting. Um, but medical virtual reality is very expensive. This is £100,000 worth of equipment. This is an Israeli company who currently don't do any thoracoscopic uh, um, simulation. Um, but our core trainees are expected to do uh, 200 hours um, of time on this. We've got two of these machines in Newcastle. The plus points from this sort of simulation is you can get tactile feedback. It's lifelike. There's definite analysis of movements, analysis of your variations, analysis of your conversions, your safety, and your risk profile. All instrumentation is possible simply by choosing. And there are different levels of difficulty. Bleeding is very authentic. I have done a gallbladder uh, dissection myself. The place is filling up with blood. And you do feel as though you are in trouble. And there is a correlation with cross-sectional anatomy where you can bring in CT uh, axial screen uh, in, into, in, into the same um, screen model. We've also got cadaveric dissection. Um, you have the reality of going around arteries and bronchi. You've got the reality of staping fissures, dissecting lymph nodes. And this in itself is a big step to human operating. And as I say, we would hope to be offering a national cadaveric VAPS training course soon. You can go abroad, as I have done. There's a pig model in Hamburg. Uh, it's an alive model, at least to start with. It's a good tactile sensation, and there's pressure to perform well because the pericardium is very sensitive. The nearest thing to live human operating, but in the UK we have license problems with this. We've looked at EVLP in Newcastle. We run that as part of our transplant program. And it's a great idea on paper. You've got the ability to ventilate once you intubate uh, a trachea and you have good tactile feedback. We've had trouble with perfusion in a, a simulated uh, model. And of course, um, you have to consider your pig lung resource. My feel is that operative training is attitudinal. Absolutely anything is possible. Although you have to think of the patient, not yourself, not your numbers. Think that's for all until you are proven otherwise. Pre-consider the risk, think opportunistically, and do the easy stuff first and listen to the voice at the back of your head, I still have Mr. Walker in the back of my head. So how can we enhance live human operating? I think absolutely we need to move into simulation. We have prior simulation, we have operating, we have camera work, all of which need to be accomplished. A good camera work person who's actually assisting and doing none of the VATS case will eventually be able to do the VATS case. It's clear who's a good camera worker. You have to have the team spirit, the, the environment that you work in. You have to have the time and understanding of people around about you. 
HD vision is an imperative in my view. We've moved in last year into HD, which is belatedly, but has made a huge difference to what we can do. You have to respect the intercostal space, and that's the whole point after all of doing this. You don't spread the ribs and you don't cause pain. There's a ladder of complexity. You can use a library of fair copy videos. We will hopefully be recording fairly soon everything and putting it onto network rather than disk. And all of that can be edited by the trainee so that they can identify where their poor economy of movement is. You can use simulation nationally in the ISCP as an assessment. It runs side to side, side by side with, with uh, operative training. It can be simulation appropriate for the year of training. It enables accelerated operating and certainly will give you a better chance if you can prove to your consultant that you've done well in your simulation then they're more likely to give you a chance to do well in operating theatre. It's certainly in the best interest of the trainees in that respect and shows the rate of progression. In order to fly solo, proctorship does exist. We've heard René and, and other people talk about their experiences and that clearly there's industry support which will allow us to go off to Copenhagen and places like this uh, to get international expertise into this field. There's proctorship now, I think, within a growing body of people in the UK as well, and therefore trainees can, can arrange for interdeanary transfer or, or indeed out of programme experience within the country. It's imperative to keep up to date and therefore come to conferences like this where you'll find like-minded support. And hopefully that will lead to us, at least in the UK, moving on to infinity and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.